it's a true New York moment right now. Um, please join me in welcoming the amazing Chris Stein and Debbie Harry. How are you both feeling? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having us. It's our pleasure. I guess you turn this that off. Yeah, okay. place is <laughs> so opulent. <laughs> I can't believe this is all was paid for by the proceeds of caffeinated sugar beverages. Pretty much. Amazing. Yeah. What was um? What did West 18th Street look, used to look like? Uh, before this was 18th Street. Well, where we are right means now. here. Oh. Physically, it wasn't that different. It was pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. but mm. it's just the interiors have changed. Yeah. And the quality of the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chris is very impressed with the... So you have red cameras, I cameras. see? Cameras. So yeah, those are not cheap. Well, you were sort of a pioneer of early early New York camera stuff, weren't you? I mean, you did, you did one of the first almost like pirate TV. We did this thing called TV Party, which was on cable TV once a week. Amazing. And, and I guess it started in, I don't know, 1980, 79, 80. It went on for four years. At that point, cable TV was only available from 14th Street, no, 23rd Street uptown. So if you lived below 23rd Street, you couldn't see it anyway. It was only for the well-to-do. And, and what did you do on TV Party? We smoked a lot of weed and went crazy and... and had, you know, just carried on. It was kind of like going to a club once a week, but everybody just gathered in this TV studio. Well, we'd start out in the in the bar across the street. Yeah. And then work our way across into the studio. So that was always nice. And w what kind of characters did you get to meet on TV party? Well, everybody was on the show at one point. Uh, Iggy was on and uh, The Clash, I think, I think Mick Jones was on. And yeah, there we have TV party outtakes. It's very entertaining. That's Glenn O'Brien. He is the host of TV Party. He's trying to revamp it now. It's, it's out there. He's Wasn't, an old, uh, he's didn't an old Niall guy. Niall go on one time? Niall was on. Niall was on. George Clinton was George Clinton, one of his very few TV appearances, was on TV Party. You have the, a Basquiat interview on there Basquiat as well. Basquiat was on frequently. He, he did the camera. And those things that Glenn is holding up, those scribbles are by Jean-Michel probably. And yeah, those are Jean-Michel. Are in Glenn's archives of worth millions of dollars. It's amazing, yeah. So Jean-Michel Basquiat did the, did the titles for your... Yeah, and he for, typed in that TV stuff. Party. Yeah, he was frequently typing in that, that... This is all very high-tech at the time. Typing? That doesn't look like typing. All the stuff, the... the, the scribble, those are... Scribble. No, no, the overlay, the extra bread, oh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that, that in, all, in all probability, is John <laughs> typing that stuff. That was Richie Fliegler. He was in a lot of bands. That was me with a hood on. This might have been medieval night or something. Anyway, that yeah, this this is the uh, comp compilation that some of these guys from Brink Films have thrown together. It's it's entertaining. If nobody's familiar with it. And there was always a famous phone-in part of the show as well, right? We took phone calls, yeah. And what kind of phone calls would you get? A, a lot of rude phone calls. <laughs> But it was great. Yeah, it was very, it was very funny. So I mean, some of the some of the names that you casually mentioned um, as we were talking there, obviously, sort of New York legends, folklore, almost. Um, do you want to paint a picture of of what this town was like at the period you were shooting TV Party? Well, as I was in the car coming here, I looked up uh, the glamour of decay, and I found a lot of different things, but no linking theme. But there is. I, I didn't have enough time to look on my phone for literary references to the glamour of decay, but I'm sure they're out there. And there was some, there was something very glamorous about being in the midst of this uh, just rot that we were all in in New York City at the time. It was absolutely. It's become New York City has become the complete opposite animal of what it was in the... Yeah, everywhere I used to go on on tour, 
people would ask me with, you know, trembling, tremblingly ask me, how can you live in New York City? I I was hearing that Detroit is going to, they're actually talking about selling off the uh, public art collection because they're in such bad shape. So if, if you want to get a glimpse of what urban decay is like now, I, yes. you know, Detroit, to Detroit. Detroit is in kind of poor condition. There's a lot of great music there. Like, yeah, lot of, Detroit is awesome. But New York was in the throes of, you know, everything back in the late 70s. Mm. And it was famously declared bankrupt, right? Yeah, and, well, and famously the... Ford was it said you know there was a headline that said Ford to city drop dead when he re- we had the hell we had the headline you guys really good did your homework that's great uh, I guess he was he was you know refusing some benefit that the government was supposed to supply some you know aid or something was yes. it really was mixed. like another country it was a different place than any place in in the states, and now it's sort of become uh, very acceptable, and uh, you know, well, people come here to raise families, which is unheard of. Really, mm. was unheard of. And Chris, you're from Brooklyn, right? Yeah, Brooklyn. Yeah. And, and Debbie, you're from New Jersey originally. North right? Jersey, yeah. So, what were those sort of original forays into kind of voyaging to, into New York like for you as a, as a oh, young person? Oh, it was person? very exciting. I always wanted to uh, be a part of it, and. Um, it was a, an escape route for me, and uh, I always knew that I was not cut out for suburbia, and I really had no interest in um, that kind of life. Uh, although I had great friends there, and uh, you know, lots of good times, lots of laughs, but uh, I always intended to move to New York. When, when we first started coming in in the 60s, it was even before the decline, and the Lower East Side was still neighborhood, neighborhoody and yeah, had yeah. immigrant, you know, descendants, and it was it wasn't the Wild West yet, as it became in, later in the you know in the 70s. So when did you first move here, Debbie? From- I first moved here in the mid 60s. Okay, and what yeah. were the first kind of jobs that you did when you arrived <laughs> in New York? To make it, I, I just did anything really. I uh, worked in uh, retail, or actually, I was in. I worked in a wholesale market for uh, sort of. Um, phew, I, I forget the name of the companies. Ah, Hold Howard and uh, Colonial Candle. I sold candles to department stores, which you know was. I was terrible at it, but they kept me on. <laughs> when did you work for the BBC at some point? I worked for the, the BBC after that uh, as a secretary, and then I worked in the first head shop in New York City, and uh, that was that was a lot of fun to meet all the uh, downtown people and uh, look at you know have all of the great psychedelic. Posters and pipes and all that stuff. So I, I fit right in mm-hmm. over there. First head shop was on Ninth Street. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like off Second, maybe. Uh, yeah, was right around. Well, it was right around the corner from where Veselka is now. Yeah, right. I think Veselka might have actually been there. Yeah, I think it's been there for yeah. a long time. I, I remember going into the first head. We have we overlapped before we met later on, mm-hmm. and we both were at Woodstock. At the festival. Yes. We're old people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the precursor to you meeting, do you want to just, what's the musical backdrop at this point? At that then? Yeah, at that time, yeah. Like what, what was music that you were, like, inhaling and, and digesting as a, as a young person? Oh, everything. Mm. Yeah. Me? Listen to everything. I think, it, it, you know, radio was very uh, homogenous, yeah, the, you know they played they played everything really. Yeah, the red, there were everything wasn't as um, genre specific as it is now. So on the same radio station, you'd hear James Brown, and then you'd hear the Rolling Stones, and you know something that now it's gone. All that the days of yeah everything being played together certainly, <laughs> but that's that started going out a long time ago. And, you know, we like the Velvet Underground. 
we were all aware of those guys. They showed up in the midst of the flower power era with this, you know, dark record about heroin and death. That, that <laughs> and got everybody's attention, certainly. And so tell us, how did you guys first meet? I had a, f- f- I, you know, everybody, it was kind of incestuous. Everybody was somehow related to everybody else on the scene. Yeah. And I just went to their first show with the stilettos. She was doing this girl trio thing. And I actually, I wound up going to the first event of theirs and was very taken with Debbie. I thought she was terrific. And that was it. And then I, I became the first non uh, I became a regular member of the band <laughs> after that. Of a were, band called The Stilettos. The right? Stilettos, yeah. Yeah. Sort of girl, campy, cabaret, R&B thing. And when you referred to the scene, you said, oh, everyone knew each other on the scene. What was the scene? Just, you know, the art scene and the spillover from Max's Kansas City. CBS hadn't really started up. It was It was going when we first met, but it hadn't really started the ongoing band situation that came later but so it, you know the art scene was heavily mixed in with the music scene the music scene was still coming out of the west village with the remnants of the 60s bands um you know like the the night owl and the love and spoonful and all that stuff and the folk music scene uh it, it yeah everybody was kind of it was a lot of maybe more of a small town thing and there seemed to be sort of a, a, a video and film thing happening at the same time in downtown. There's almost like a mini Hollywood effect going on but in, within your your community with people like Amos Poe and Jim Jarmusch. And, and I mean, do you want to talk about that whole scene and how music and film was connected? Well, I, to me, the central milieu was always Max's, where which was the everything sort of radiated out from there because that's where all the art people in the arts met and collected. Mm-hmm. And that was the Max's uh, from yeah. before the 70s. It yeah. later evolved into uh, a a pretty much a, a, a yeah. rock place. But, but when it, Mickey Ruskin originally owned it, I mean, he's the guy who invented the velvet rope situation, you know, whereby, really? you know. Yeah, and he was mm. the he was the first one to have people waiting outside and go. You you can come in. You can't come in. You know. <laughs> yeah. So that was wow. The, and is now the right time to show a little clip from this um, one of the films that you were in, Debbie? Or do you want me to not do that? This uh, the unmade beds. You know, oh. one of those movies just yeah. to give an idea of the time. Uh, Amos Poe, yeah. yeah, unmade beds. Oh, was that Duncan? Duncan Hannah. Yeah. Who is a painter. Yeah, pa- Duncan the painter. Curse you, YouTube. Well, we were all such brats, you know. She looked really good. You and ready stuff. to take my picture? My name is Rico. Not little Rico. Rico the photographer. Rico the liar. Rico, the one that falls in love with his eyes, but never with his heart. Rico. That's me. Yes, it's true, but little Rico is someone I could kiss. What do you want these pictures, anyhow? Well, Duncan's pretty gorgeous, too. Can I have some vodka? Sure. Pour me one, too. Pictures are for publicity, to put in the windows and bars, and for newspapers, and one for my boyfriend. Now, Amos thought that he was Godard. (laughs) And we got we got to meet Godard around this period a few years later. Really? There was, yeah. yeah. There was yeah. there was a lot of we had this idea to remake Alphaville, so we actually we got to hook up with Godard and he sold us the rights for a thousand bucks, which we later found out he really didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Amos actually has the contract somewhere, but wow. it never got remade. And uh, he was talking about pictures in that you, of course. 
were a keen photographer as well, Chris. Yeah, I was, I was at the School of Visual Arts, and I, was, I started doing shooting when I was a little kid with my little dinky cameras, and then I started more seriously in around 68. And I was just always dragging a camera around. And you brought some, some pictures in I as well. I have some old pictures here. Oh, yeah, she has a little ditty she sings. So these these are the pictures that you brought in for us today. Uh, yeah, that's Debbie and Iggy on the Idiot Tour in 77. That's Debbie in front of CB's on a... Yeah, did we ever find out who owned that car? No, I never found any any backstory that on the car. That car was always parked in front of CB's, and nobody knew whose car yeah. it was. That's Devo in our hallway. Amazing. Yeah. That's a real early shot I took with a timer. Yeah, 105 Thompson Street. Yeah, on Thompson Street. Clem really doesn't like that because he has long hair, and he decries his his days as a deadhead. <laughs> That's Kim Fowley in Los Angeles of the Runaways, you know, the guy who invented the Runaways and many other things. That's Lester Bangs on the, in an outtake from Mutant Monster Beach Party, was, which was done for Punk Magazine. And people. And that's, that's at Coney Island. That was at Coney Island, yeah. yeah. And that's Eric Emerson and Sesu Coleman, who were. These guys were in a kind of bridge band that went from the, the glam New York glitter, Dolls glitter, era glitter. into the punk. Era, you know, Eric died early. He was a terrific character. He was he was in a bunch of the Warhol films. He was one of the superstars, sort of. He was in Heat and Lonesome Cowboys, and those suckers. he <laughs> <laughs> has got the t-shirt. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I came right from the gym, and I love to work out in my Ramon shirt. Yes, it gives me, you know, <laughs> something. <laughs> and Richard. Uh, it was his at his last gig with the Heartbreakers. That's upstairs at Max's. And Richard the, Hell, yeah. And that's Walter Lure's hand. That's one of my favorite pictures of mine. It's very noir. And the Screamers from L.A. And the the guy on the the left, Tomato, we knew from uh, the weird sort of shock rock drag scene in New York much earlier, even before the CB scene. I he was. Uh, in New York. And that's Steve Bader is um, just like a couple of weeks before he died in Paris. Now going back to the Ramones and you keep you've mentioned CBs at least five times already. Yeah. That. Let let's define um you're of course referring to the legendary club venue CBGB's in New York. Um I think it's worth having a conversation about CBGB's and and what it meant to you and what it was like. <laughs> Well, I spent a lot of time there. I have a thing there tomorrow. I've got, a, I've got some interview with German TV at the... And, I, you know, I haven't even set foot in the Barbados store, like, ever. So I will I'll go in there tomorrow. Just to define, what, what are you talking about when well, you say... Well, CBGB's is now the um, a clothing store, a high-end men's clothing store, which is John Varvatos, which is a really nice guy, actually. I just haven't gotten in there. It's kind of mind-boggling to walk on the block. I, you know, I, I, used to, I used to spend so much damn time there, and now when I walk there, it's kind of disorienting because it's, it's, it's just so different. It's even hard to see where you are physically. So it's fair to say that CBGB's was really a hub for, you know, the, your scene at that particular time and your peers. And who are some of the other artists and, and sort of creatives that would just be hanging out there every night? Oh, Lance, Lance Loud, you know, anybody know who Lance Loud, there was a, there was a, Lance Loud was the victim of the very first reality TV show, I dare say, mm -hmm. which was called An American Family, whereby uh, the cameras followed this family around for years at a time, and in the midst of this show, the son came came out as gay, and this was a real big deal. I don't I don't know. I should have a time. I don't have a time frame. I haven't really thought about this, but um, and that was Lance, and he had a he wound up in CBGBs with a band called the Mumps, right? Yeah, I think so. And uh, and it eventually uh, tore up the family, broke up the marriage. Um, <laughs> 
perfect ending, cataclysmic ending. I think they, I think they did an HBO docu about the show, but I'm not sure. Mm. It's kind of obscure stuff. Mm. And everyone refers to CBGBs as famously being like stinky, nasty. It was pretty nasty and and stinky, and there were dogs who used to poop around and stuff, yeah. (laughs) I I wonder, you know, uh, I've heard that uh, there's a lot of sort of areas uh, or potentially, you know, the sort of creativity of the time in Berlin now. Does anybody know about that? Is that that reality? Yeah, it's all happening over there. pretty cool. And it, I mean, it must have been amazing to feel that momentum. Were you aware of how significant the momentum that was going on in and around the orbit of that club was at the time, or was it just a club that you used to hang out in? I think everybody was pretty much in the moment. I don't. Yeah. Really, I don't think I, I. Certainly, I wasn't. I don't think I was thinking. Yes, I think it was a love-hate relationship, and you know, as they say, the best bar or club is the one closest to home. So, you know, for many of us. That was the truth. That was the, the reality that, you know, we lived within, you know, uh, I don't know, five or six block radius of, of the club. So it, it, it started out really as a local phenomenon and, 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 and it, it just grew because we, we built it, you know, uh, through the press. You know, there was, uh, I don't know, it was very kind of intimate and personal and, and the newspapers started covering it and then... Um, you know, fledgling managers would, you know, come in and they would, uh, you know, sort of try to promote people and um, it just sort of built up. It was a, a sort of a natural build, which which worked to our benefit, worked to all of our benefits because we were allowed to uh, develop our our sounds, our act, our artistry, our thinking in veritable, you know, privacy, you know, and, you know, we would face the criticism of our our, you know, contemporaries, which was often, you know, very uh, extreme, um, but, you know, important. So, you know, that, that was kind I of a, a real plus. What I've often said is, you know, the, the scene there and in Seattle and in Liverpool and a few other places really got to ferment for a while before mm. it was jumped on by the media. Nowadays, as soon as something rears its head even that much, it's, you know, it's out there for everybody to see. So I don't know if that situation can ever really happen again. Yeah, this was before cell phones even. Oh. Yeah, let alone all the rest of this stuff. Yeah. But, and, and certainly the love-hate thing is, a, I mean, everybody then had a real love-hate relationship with the city in general. I remember everybody was always going, oh, I can't wait to get out of here. It's so crummy. It's so dirty. And that was, that was a constant theme. And now I wish it was that crummy and dirty again, you know, <laughs> certainly. Was everyone broke back then? Yeah. And yeah. And it was also very, that's the other, yeah. I mean, the main thing was it was so easy to live here. For, cheap, for no yeah. money. It didn't cost anything to live here. When I was in the 60s, there were still apartments. I had new people who had apartments that cost $20 a month for a tub and kitchen, you know, on the Lower East Side, you know, single room. You could get, you get 20 bucks a month. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's like, might as well be 1888, you know. <laughs> and uh, and, fa- and uh, famously, when you started Blondie, you had this, this top to bottom house almost, right? We Where you had, had a creative yeah. space that you could just rehearse in. We had three floors over a liquor store that we moved in. This crazy friend of ours was the proprietor of, I don't know, he got, he got it from Ansel, another long incestuous story. So he wound up with this three-story loft, which he invited us to move into, which was really nice. And cheap? Yeah, it was like, yeah. What was it, 300 bucks a month or something? No, it was 100 and a quarter. That, well, that was, I don't know if that was our share. Or yeah, that wealthy. was our share. Yeah. yeah. And where was that? Uh, 266 Bowery. It's... There's, there's no landmarking on it. <laughs> and what kind of area was that it back was, then? Was, well, what? The guy from the Marbles lives there Yeah, now. Well, somebody, we were in there like a few years ago. They, they, yeah, they right. sectioned it all off. And Ruined it's, it. It's still kind of wrecked. The, for the top floor, no, the top floor, the is, top floor is still Yeah, it's still destroyed. Do you remember? Yeah, we, yeah. So we wound up in there doing some TV thing. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like some Chinese absentee landlord who doesn't give a fuck and it's not, oh, you know. I thought that woman owned it. No, I, nah, somebody else owns it, some mm. guy. But it's now it's right across the street from the Museum of something or other. What is that <laughs> down there on the Bowery? 
New, New Museum. New yeah. Museum, okay, yeah. That. So that, you know, it's, it's not what, I mean, it used to be across the street, there were just derelict, empty storefronts that all the homeless guys would live in. Only in those days, you didn't call them homeless, they were just bums. So. Yeah, they were bums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you were cold, probably, no, not much central heating, and you were in this kind of empty, <laughs> empty space, but what did this space give birth to, creative, well, creatively we, we, speaking? We rehearsed there and did a lot of stuff for the first album. The build-up to the first album went on there. And then, and then we would just go across the street to CBGB's. It was a, you know it was like one block below Houston Street, and yep. we would just drag this stuff to CBGB's. And we, at one point, we played at CBGB's every weekend for seven months in a row. Wow! So I re remember that noting that at the time. So, as Blondie was your was your first gig officially at CBGB's? No, the first gig mm. was at this. The first gig with Gary was at oh shit. Some bar. The mushroom? No, I can't no. remember what the hell it was called. Now, I have it. It's in the book. It's in Making Tracks. The, uh. the, there's actually a photo from it. It was another bar. Because there were a bunch of other places that people played at alternately. And when you finally did perform at your sort of home club, CBGBs, you know, and you've got people like the Ramones or Talking Heads in the audience or whatever, you know, what did they say after you performed? And, and was that a bit nerve wracking for you performing in front of your friends? Yeah. No, the the band people weren't that critical. Yeah, it was um, just nerve wracking. It was performing. the other assholes that hung around. You know, they always had something to say, but the, you know, like the band guys were, you know, all paranoid about what they were doing. So I mean, everybody was sort of oh, like you know, sort of staggering around and trying to figure it out. And you know, everybody said, oh yeah, yeah, uh, nice show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's kind of amazing when you think about just you know going on this in this dark, crappy bar for twenty people and being uptight and worrying about how you're, <laughs> how you're going to come off. You yeah. Know. So but, somehow it went from being basically as hip and cool as you could possibly be to now where we can say that you've sold forty million records. I think the official statistic is something this day. That's this a day. drop in the bucket. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody remember what? Because we remember what records were. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what to call it anymore. Yeah. It's not. You know, we call it a collection at this collection, point. Collection. Yeah. yeah. But what was the tipping point? What was that moment where you went from playing for your for your mates basically in in a in a bar to suddenly being asked to go? abroad or being on tour or having a hit record? It was it took a couple of years to build up. We went to L.A. Um, that was a big deal, going to L.A. for the first time. Yeah. The first gigs we did out of town were like Boston and Philadelphia. Uh, going on tour with Iggy was a big deal. That was that was pretty awesome. You know, we, the Idiot Tour included Bowie backing up Iggy on keyboards and singing backups, and that was an amazing moment. So we were suddenly out in America in 1977 with that, and that was terrific. And then you, you had a hit in Australia, right? The hit in Australia probably predated the Iggy thing, okay. maybe. I don't know. when It could have even been... I don't know the dates of this shit. Maybe 76 was the hit, and then the other stuff, then it's even really started kicking off in 77. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not good at that. Somebody has to look it up and put it as a crawl, you know. I don't know how, I mean, it's important that, you know, it was this, this sort of gradual buildup, and, and I think that that's what we're trying to talk about, is that, you know, there was this, as Chris says, fermentation for us, you know, and, and not instant exposure and... and you know this this kind of worldwide manufactured exposure. Um, mm. So you know we sort of really understand how important that was for us. Mm. You you kind of had the privilege in a way of controlling your image as well. I mean you you seem to be aware of the aesthetic of what you were doing through your photography as well yeah. and presenting that to the world in a way that you wanted it to be communicated. To, to a certain extent. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was always, that is the do-it-yourself theme that we've always applied to ourselves. It, yeah. it was, we never had stylists and we never had anything like that. Certainly it was all, but none of the people. Well, basically the, it was because it was like pre- Easy technology. I mean, technology now has become easy. 
and everyone can experiment, and, and that's, that's the way that the process of learning is about. It's about experimentation, and so we did that in a quiet way, and, and now people do that in, you know, in front of you know, millions of people, so whatever you, know, you feel comfortable with, or I mean, whatever's available, it's just a part of what we do uh, in the creative process, or in the process of communication. Mm -hmm. So communication used to be very localized in, in the major cities of the world, and now it's not. It's, it's everywhere, which, you know, what, I don't know if it's good or bad. Does anybody? And, and when you were putting it, those images out into the world, Debbie, when was the first time that you realized that you were sort of gaining momentum as this almost iconic figure in rock and roll and that the image was a huge part of what you were doing as well? I always knew about image being important and, um, you know, was very attached to that, you know, as a, as a kid, you know, looking at other artists and, and film stars or... You know, I, I always thought, oh, well, gee, that's that's great looking, or you know, and especially in rock and roll, it's very, you know, it was very visual. If you didn't have the visual content, for me, it, you know, didn't didn't really add up. So, um, I think that the first time that I ever really realized, you know, that this had become something was not until in the '80s when I tried to re-establish. My uh, my recording career, and uh, and then it sort of, it, you know, like the late '80s, early '90s, it really just sort of was staggering to me that this, you know, had become bigger. I mean, it was just ridiculous, mm -hmm. you know, that this image thing had had really worked. Mm. Well, I mean, a lot of people famously say that you know, without Debbie Harry, you you wouldn't necessarily have a Madonna or. A, Gaga or people who have been very image conscious in, in, in the future but for me it's like the music with you guys always came first mm -hmm. and, and, and it seemed like the image was you know, an amazing powerful tool in getting the music to people, is that a fair thing to say? Well I don't think one would have worked without the other uh, for sure um, I, the music was the basis for it so um, you know, I think that we were dedicated to that, I mean it, it was a struggle to you know, bring the music to, to the public. And um, so, I mean, that was actually the driving force. Mm. And talking of the music, what's the first song that we should play? Of this stuff? Of this stuff. Is it like Ex know. Offender or In Where the Flesh or those oh. early ones? Is that old stuff? I yeah. Don't I don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear that? <laughs> you can't, you can't, oh, God. <laughs> can you input it later? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, li I like that the stuff, you know, it, it doesn't sound dated necessarily. Uh, well, that's okay. Well, maybe, yeah, it's cute. Well, maybe we should fast forward to Denis, which was, you know, oh. massive in the UK. Oh. No? Well, yeah, she, no, uh, no, you know, it's, it's all right. It's just, you She know. doesn't, Denis, Denis is always a, a, a thorn because it has <laughs> ooby do in the lyrics. Yeah. And it's really difficult to go out and sing ooby do, you know, mm. for anybody. Even. <laughs> <laughs> God. But you okay. could play it. I mean, what you the fuck, you know? <laughs> and see how you feel about it. What should we do, Denis? Why don't I find the um? No, the... no, no. I've... No, she's not going to want to hear anything. Say no more. I mean, we don't sit around I'll, and listen I'll to this stuff. I'll leave the room, and you guys, you know, get tortured. <laughs> well, this is significant for more than one reason because I think it's fair to say that this this moment in the UK was explosive. You know why? Why I didn't dance, or why? You know why? Why didn't you dance on stage? Uh, you know, on, on top of the pops. And I said, well, because when we got to the top of the pops, they would point to places where we should stand, and then the cameras would do all the movement. Right. So it wasn't like they would really, you know, tape or you know, film a, a video performance or a, any kind of real performance. It was their performance. It was the Top of the Pops performance. 
And uh, the, the clip we're watching is from a, a program in the UK called Top of the Pops. What's, what's the US equivalent of that? The American Bandstand, uh, at this point, American Idol, but I mean, you know, um, but the, that wasn't, well, everything was always lip synced on Top of the Pops, but there almost was no equivalent because unlike the, um, unlike the states, in the, in the states, there's no national anything, really. I mean, yeah, there's a couple of TV shows. There certainly is no national print media the way in the UK, you know, you had Melody Maker and NME and all those things. Everybody in the country read the New Musical Express, you know, the NME. And it was a, um, it was a taste-making device for the whole country. And it went out, everybody saw it all at the same time. Yeah. It was, there was no equivalent in the state, certainly, of that, you know? Well, certainly, you know, the power of the enemy in the UK and, of course, Top of the Pops, which is 7 p.m. on a weekday night. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you feel the impact of that straight away when you started touring England? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, at first, there was this blondie mania moments where, you know, with people rushing the cars and buses and stuff like that which was not happened hadn't happened in the states you know and did you enjoy that sort of level of attention debbie that cult status that happened immediately i, was, I wasn't really used to it and uh, i had you know led a much different kind of life um i wanted to you know be famous but i wasn't really aware of what it meant in terms of you know curbing my activities you know i was used to a much freer kind of life and did you find like lots of musicians and and creatives that it was only sort of when you left your hometown that you were able to really kind of quote unquote blow up as it were you mean from new york yeah well you know it was pretty interesting you know we had this weird thing happen in australia and uh, we went down there with uh, two guys as our crew, no manager, no production, and um, it was pretty, pretty funky. It was pretty wild. And uh, we had, th at that time, the hit song of In the Flesh, which was a sweet little, you know, sort of old-fashioned song, um, almost like an Everly Brothers song. Well, that's too loud. <laughs> Anyway, so we got to Australia, and they were expecting, you know, Olivia Newton-John singing this sweet little song and various other sweet little songs, and uh, it wasn't. The whole, you know, audience just sort of sat there like this. It was very interesting. We were, you know, highly entertained as well. And um, you mentioned sort of management. Um, was this the beginning of your sort of career, getting managers, getting record deals and that kind of thing? And what was that experience like at the height of the mania worldwide? Well, we did have a manager when we went down there. Yeah, Only he, he just, you he know, didn't come. he just threw us out there yeah. right. with these two two guys. And um, but but that said, the recording, I mean, the, the music business, the touring business in those days was nothing like it is no, now. No, it's much anyway, different. You know, it was it like was, going out, going somewhere, and just doing a bunch of club dates but in another country. Mm -hmm. And then famously, you know, once you were with, uh, was it Chrysalis, your record label? Or? Uh, yeah, that well, was, Chrysalis, we, we wound up on. We were first with a smaller label in the States called Private Stock, mm. which was... Um, a hobby. <laughs> yeah, kind of a, a what do you call <laughs> a hobby it? Label. A vanity project yeah. for this guy who had, been, who had been partners with uh, Seymour. Yeah. He had been partners with Seymour Stein, and Seymour went on to be much more of a visionary than Larry. They had been part of, I don't know, Bell or Buddha Records, and they, they split up and formed their two labels. And then, and then we got bought off private stock by, by Chrysalis. And then the whole A&R thing comes into play, and you get sent to a producer, right, for the first time. What, what, um, we should mention, actually, the other people in the group at this point. How many are you? Well, we have well. We already had a bunch of turnovers initially. I mean, there's been a lot of people in Blondie over the years, and we, you know, we started out with 
Fred and Jesus. I mean, there was a lot of people even before the success, you know. And then Gary is on the first album, and he was a very charismatic kid by his own right. And then we, then Frankie came in for the halfway through the second album. Just a lot of people. The, the main the main lineup from the, those days is uh, Gary and I, Nigel Nigel who had played with Ray Manzarek and and Manzarek in his in Night City Night who you know the now late Ray who we, was a really lovely fellow he, Nigel had been in his band Nigel played bass on the Runaways record even though it's not supposed to be him. Uh, Jimmy, who, who was there early on, Clem, who was there very early on with his drumming. And talking of drumming, we should talk about the Heart of Glass moment because that's like the... Is that the first time you were playing to a click track, right? Well, I don't on, know. On Maybe some, some of those other songs on the record. That was the first deconstructed song, I think, as such, probably. I don't even know if there's another... I think all the other songs may have had like a full kit and and a, you know at least one or a bass or rhythm guitar and or rhythm guitar with it. And what was the process of making that that song? It was just the way people make records now in pieces, where you have you know you do a bass drum on one track and you do a toms on another track, and it's just it's all pieced together. And so it was you know it was challenging to say the least. But this was produced by um, Mike. Mike. Yeah, how did that work out? Mike was terrific. Mike is, I am told, is involved with seventy number one records in his career, yeah. which is a lot. And and many of them he wrote. Yeah. So he and he was. It was great, and it was an eye-opener working with him, certainly. And is it fair to say that that was kind of, it had a bit of a disco era tinge to it, that record, right? Well, we really thought we were, sounded like Kraftwerk. We didn't, weren't thinking of <laughs> disco at all, and it just, it's kind of slotted in there, you know. But, I mean, it did become a big record at 54 and some of those clubs as well, right? And, and was it your first number one? Uh, in the States, yeah, it was the first American number one. So that was a big deal. Okay. Yeah, it was a big deal. Mike came to Italy. We were in Milan and um, wanted us to come down to the bar and have a drink and didn't say why why he was there. But, and uh, we didn't want to go down to the bar. <laughs> but he, he insisted that we come down to the bar. And um, then we, that's when we found out. Because, you know, America is, a, is with all its little regional markets and different tastes all over the country, it's still like that. It's hard to, to have one thing rise to the surface. It's difficult. us last Monday so it's interesting to join the dots in, in this sort of era of music obviously he was yeah. doing his work with, with Donna and well the thing that was interesting when we finally met Giorgio and talked about 
you know, the writing and the music and everything. He said that, you know, he had written I Feel Love uh, about five years before, you know, he could actually record it yeah, and that it would be accepted. No one was ready for it. And and, and that was the, the truth for us with Heart of Glass. The Heart of Glass had been around for us for over five years. That's sort of funny. How, the, you know, I mean, there was always like this sort of time thing that would happen, you know, that it doesn't happen today. But it wasn't, you give us too much credit here, this this version of it. Well, was, no, yeah. We kind of put together in the studio. You know, we, so. yeah, I mean, this version for sure. But yeah. I'm sure that that was partially with Giorgio, too. But, you know, I, lo I love how this doesn't sound dated at all. It sounds like MIDI. We all, everybody knows what MIDI is, you know, musical instrument digital interface, which is the language that all this crap uses to talk to itself and to it, other things. And it sounds like something like that, only this took, you know, I don't know, days and days to put the track together. Whereas now, if you had the idea, you could put it together in an hour or so, you know. I mean, how was this received, considering it was a hit at 54 and it was, you know, adopted in much the same way that a Donna Summer record would be by club DJs? How was that received by your peers from the CBGB days? Ah, well. I, I, you know, it's kind of, I, I think it was pretty, I mean, Joey Ramon saying we sold out is kind of tongue in cheek, really. I don't know if he was really seriously pissed off about it, you know, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Did Joey ever get seriously pissed off about it? Yeah, there you go. that's something else, too, yeah. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, one thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, what was I going to say? Oh, well, must have been a lie. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I wanted to talk to you about sort of tapping into sort of New York musical culture as well, because obviously this has a, a does have a tinge of that era of, of club record. And then, of course, you know, from from my generation, one of the most famous lyrics in music of all time is, of course, that by Freddie says everybody's fly. And um, you know, I, I just wanted you to talk about the rapture moment, really, and. Um, because I think it's probably fair to say that you're the first group with a popular reach that introduced rap on a record. I mean, certainly, I think it's fair to say you introduced the idea to a sort of a worldwide public or a pop public, perhaps, that hadn't yet had the opportunity to come into contact with New York hip-hop culture. Um, how did you meet Fab Five Freddy? Probably from TV party around there, maybe... Uh, yeah, I think he showed up at either either CB's or TV Party. Yeah, yeah. I think it was TV Party. <laughs> well, he he's was a, a very entrepreneurial character, and uh, you know, just was adventurous. You know, and uh, he likes connecting the dots. You know, he was all over. And he is still today. I mean, totally. He'll uh, call me up and say, well, what about this? And I, I mean, it's like, Fred, how did you know this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's sort of two seconds after something happens, he knows. So in 1977, he took a bunch of us uptown to the Bronx to a police athletic league, which is like a youth center, neighborhood youth center. And um, we saw this big event, yeah. this big rap event, which was super exciting. It was just phenomenal. Yeah. And it was it was a game changer for me, certainly. It was good because it, I just kind of saw that it was paralleling what was going on downtown, but we weren't really, didn't know much about it, you know. Can you describe the event, what it looked like? It was uh, we, it was like a gymnasium type thing with a stage, and there was a, it was the, it wasn't just a gig by one group. It was a bunch, it was kind of a festival where there were a bunch of groups, uh, Flash and Funky Four and maybe Cold Crush and I can't even remember. I was talking to Charlie about it. Actually, he had a memory of it too. I think he may have been with us actually. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I don't know. I can't remember what he said now. He was just talking because it's also the 30, 30th anniversary of Wild Style, which was the first hip hop film ever made. Yeah. And, um, it was yeah. It was just terrific. The energy level was was amazing. 
I mean, perhaps it's not for me to say, of course, but I always got the sense that you were very much respected sort of amongst the hip-hop community because you were kind of celebrating and crediting what you were tapping into as opposed to taking it. You know, it's like you put a lot of people on an international stage, of course, including Flash, which is probably the first time I saw him in a video. And um, is it, is, am I right in thinking... Well, it's a double-edged thing. You flew out Curtis Blow to the UK as well, right? Is that Down true? Yeah, I can't I think remember. So, yeah. Is that, yeah, you yeah. remember that? I can't remember. Yeah. And we That's had... The Funky Four Plus One More on Saturday Night Live, and but that, yeah, that was and that was quite a well, that an was achievement. The, they were that was the first. <laughs> they were paranoid. That was the first uh, <laughs> rap act on American TV, I think, either national or local, and they still put them on at the credit crawl the at, the, outro, end of, at yeah. the end of the show. They were they didn't know what to expect. <clears throat> All right. Then they fell in love with them, you know. Maybe you can. You can talk us through who's in this video. Oh. That kind of works. Oh, yeah, it does. Ash, excuse me. They've, they've set me up with a uh, booby trap technology here. There you go. Well, I sort of like it with the new music. Yeah, I mean, you could do like David Bowie with the album cover. You just put out the old video with the new music on it. That's amazing. I like that. Supposed to be like, what is his name? Uh, Sumedi? Baron, oh yeah, Baron Sumedi. Who yeah, this the, is Baron the Sumedi. Lord of the Graveyards yeah. um, in voodoo culture. I think this guy was Haitian and he had a, he was actually a pretty great dancer. Yeah, and he, he, he brought in two. Uh, so he had three girls who were. Two girls, three girls? Three girls, yeah. yeah. Three and mamas. one of them be, sort of became possessed in the midst of the filming. So they had to carry her off and revive her. But I, you know, I, they were used to going into this sort of trance state and dancing. I think it wasn't so much our influence, certainly. Okay, that's enough of this, all right? I, you know, the rap thing is like, it's, it's a tribute more than a, an actual thing. It's an know? homage. It's not really very good. I mean, it was interesting to a lot of people, but I think that the real rappers were a little bit, you know, uptight and pissed off about it initially. Um, but I will say that this is the first rap song that had its own song, its own music, because up until then they were scratching and taking licks from yeah, you know, Chic and everything. So this was had its own embodied, you know, theme as well. I, I, somebody just, my wife just told me that the Beastie Boys' first album, had they had to pay for the samples, would have cost like $10 million or something like that. And that's Basquiat. That's Jack. Probably his only rock video appearance. Okay, come on. I'll smash your computer. I will. That's Lee, Lee, Lee Quinones, also known as Lee. A really great, brilliant graffiti artist. I don't know who that guy is. Yeah, I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was fun to do anyway. All right, well, even if you yes, don't like please, it, we're going to okay, give you a round of applause for that, okay? So where are we at in the timeline of Blondie at the moment? I think it's, do you mind me raising the fact that you're also a couple at, at this stage as well? Yeah, we were hanging out a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I mean, what, what? This is this is from Auto American, which had this and the tide is high on it. And famously, when we gave the record to Chrysalis, they said, we don't hear any singles on this record. Yeah. 
They heard that. They said that about parallel lines too. But that's what record companies do, and record companies were were and are inherently evil. Uh-huh. So let's. Just, Anybody yeah. here from a label? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Bless you. I mean, I shouldn't make a broad statement like that. I'm sure there's some indie labels and, you well, know, I mean... I think if anyone is qualified to talk about the highs and lows of the music industry, it's definitely you guys, because we should talk about... I mean, it's relevant. Obviously, we've got a room full of musically-minded producers, DJs, singers, artists. Um, you know, you you definitely had a rough ride with the management and, and money and accounting experience. Is that right? Well, well, the main thing was that the two years we made the most money, our accountant decided not to pay our taxes. So, and, and you know, because in those days it was, the, those were the days of tax shelters and loopholes and trying not to pay taxes, you know, even on a non-Apple Amazon level, so. Well, also we were extremely bad business people. And we really didn't, didn't pay attention to it or, we're very interested in it, and we sort of waited or trusted management to take care of things, which I think now people are much more knowledgeable. And, um, but although, I mean, record companies now, you know, want a percentage of, of everything that you do. So, I mean, that that's rough, too. They, they take a percentage across the board of, you know, tours, merchandise, Records or our CDs, whatever you know, whatever incomes coming in, they are entitled to some of it, which is kind of gross. Yeah, I mean, well, it is definitely a relevant subject to talk about because, you know, we mentioned forty million records at this stage in your career. I think you definitely were hitting twenty million records worldwide, and yet parting ways with a manager. And you know, how is it that you can have twenty million records on the board and and not be paid right? It's amazing. I mean, for us, we, we sit here and we're like, yeah, Blondie, Debbie, Harry, Chris Stein, superstars. But there's definitely been low points where you've had platinum discs on the wall, yeah, I imagine. Sure. And, and, and not Even funnier was when Heart of Glass was at number one, um, we were on suspension, which means that we hadn't filled the obligations of our contract. So we had a number one record. And we were also on suspension. I mean, the, the whole thing of it was mad. It was really mad. Well, it'll it'll the the goes back to the surf mentality. There used to be this the Brill Building. Does anybody know what that was? Where there was the it was a building in New York that where all the old songwriters would collect and you know write and do their work out of, and it, and it all it kind of represented the corporate aspect of the music business at the time with publishing, meaning paper publishing, physical objects and such and it was kind of a surf mentality where, where you, you were working for the record company rather than with them certainly yeah. and I mean it might be an oversimplified question but if you could impart one bit of knowledge about you know what you've learned from the bad bits oh well just don't trust anybody I mean, you know, what the fuck I mean you could that, no, that was the big the big uh, thing was having somebody come along and go, you you can trust me, son, and do that thing, and then that. that it's a true New York moment right now. Um, please join me in welcoming the amazing Chris Stein and Debbie Harry. How are you both feeling? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having us. It's our pleasure. This place is so opulent. <laughs> I can't believe this is all this paid for by the proceeds of caffeinated sugar beverages. Pretty much. Amazing. Yeah. What was um? What did West 18th Street look, used to look like? Uh, before this was 18th Street. Well, where we are right now. means here. Oh. Physically, it wasn't that different. It was pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. but mm. it's just the interiors have changed. Yeah. And the quality of the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chris is very impressed with the... So you have red cameras, I cameras. see. Cameras. So yeah, those are not cheap. Well, you were sort of a pioneer of early early New York camera stuff, weren't you? I mean, you did, you did one of the first almost like pirate TV. We did this thing called TV Party, which was on cable TV once a week. Amazing. And, and 
I guess it started in, I don't know, 1980, 79, 80. It went on for four years. At that point, cable TV was only available from 14th Street, no, 23rd Street uptown. So if you lived below 23rd Street, you couldn't see it anyway. It was only for the well-to-do. And, and what did you do on TV party? They smoked a lot of weed and went crazy and, and had, you know, just carried on. It was kind of like going to a club once a week, but everybody just gathered in this TV studio. Well, we'd start out in the, in the bar across the street yeah. and then work our way across into the studio. So that was always nice. And what, what kind of characters did you get to meet on TV party? Well, everybody was on the show at one point. Uh, Iggy was on, and uh, The Clash, I think, I think Mick Jones was on. And yeah, there we have TV party outtakes. It's very entertaining. That's Glenn O'Brien. He is the host of TV Party. He's trying to revamp it now. It's, it's out there. But he's Wasn't, an old, uh, he's an old Niall guy. Go on one time? Niall was on. Niall was on. George Clinton was a, George Clinton. One of his very few TV appearances was on TV Party. You have a Basquiat interview on there. Basquiat as well. was on frequently. He, he did the camera. And those things that Glenn is holding up, those scribbles, are by Jean Michel probably. And yeah, those are Jean Michel. Are in Glenn's archives of worth. Millions of dollars. It's amazing, yeah. So Jean-Michel Basquiat did the did the titles for your yeah and he for, typed in that TV stuff party, yeah so. he was frequently typing in that that this is all very high tech at the time typing that doesn't look like typing all well, the stuff the, the scribble those are scribble. no no the overlay the extra bread oh, that. blah 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 oh, that that in all, in all probability is John <laughs> typing that stuff. That was Richie Fliegler. He was he's in a lot of bands. That was me with a hood on. This might have been Medieval Night or something. Man calls up. He sounds insane. Anyway, that, yeah, this, this is the uh, comp- compilation that some of these guys from Brink Films have thrown together. It's, it's entertaining. If nobody's familiar with it. And there was always a famous phone-in part of the show as well, right? We took phone calls, yeah. And what kind of phone calls would you get? A, a lot of rude phone calls. <laughs> but it was great. Yeah, it was very, it was very funny. So I mean, some of the some of the names that you casually mentioned um, as we were talking there, obviously, sort of New York legends, folklore, almost. Um, do you want to paint a picture of of what this town was like at the period you were shooting TV Party? Well, as I was in the car coming here, I looked up uh, the glamour of decay, and I found a lot of different things with no linking theme. But there is, I, I didn't have enough time to look on my phone for literary references to the glamour of decay, but I'm sure they're out there. And there was some, there was something very glamorous about being in the midst of this uh, just rot that we were all in in New York City at the time. It was absolutely, it's become, New York City has become the complete opposite animal of what it was in the yeah, everywhere I used to go on on tour, people would ask me with, you know, trembling, tremblingly ask me, how can you live in New York City? Yeah. I, I was hearing that Detroit is going to, they're, they're actually talking about selling off the uh, public art collection because they're in such bad shape. So if, if you want to get a glimpse of what urban decay is like now, I speak, yes. you know. Detroit, to Detroit. Detroit is in kind of poor condition. There's a lot of great music there. Yeah, a lot of, Detroit uh, is awesome. But New York was in the throes of, you know, everything back in the late 70s. Mm. And it was famously declared bankrupt, right? Yeah, and, well, and famously, the Ford, was it, said, you know, there was a headline that said, Ford to City, drop dead. <laughs> when he re- we had the hell we had the headline. You guys really good did your homework. That's great. Uh, I guess he was <laughs> he was you know refusing some benefit that the government was supposed to supply some you know aid or something was. Yes, it ne- really was mixed. like another country. It was a different place than any place in in the states, and now it's sort of become 
very acceptable and uh, you know well, people come money. here to raise families which is unheard of really mm. was unheard of and Chris you're from Brooklyn right yeah Brooklyn yeah and and Debbie you're from New Jersey originally North right? Jersey yeah so what were those sort of original forays into kind of voyaging to, into New York like for you as a, as a oh, young person? Oh, it's very exciting. I always wanted to uh, be a part of it. And um, it was a, an escape route for me. And uh, I always knew that I was not cut out for suburbia. And I really had no interest in um, that kind of life. Uh, although I had great friends there. And, uh, you know, lots of good times, lots of laughs. But uh, I always intended to move to New York. When, when we first started coming in in the 60s, it was even before the decline. And the Lower East Side was still neighbor, neighborhoody and yeah. had yeah. immigrant, you know, descendants. And it, was, it wasn't the Wild West yet, as it became in, later in the, you know, in the 70s. So when did you first move here, Debbie? I first moved here in the mid-60s. Okay. And what yeah. were the first kind of jobs that you did when you <laughs> arrived in New York to make it? I, I just did anything, really. Mm. I uh, worked in uh, retail. Or actually, I, was in, I worked in a wholesale market for uh, sort of... Um, phew, I, I forget the name of the companies. Ah, Hold Howard and uh, Colonial Candle. I sold candles to department stores, which, you know, was, I was terrible at it, but they kept me on. <laughs> when did you work for the BBC at some point? I worked Any? for the BBC after that uh, as a secretary, and then I worked in the first head shop in New York City, and uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun to meet all the uh, downtown people and uh, look at, you know, have all of the great psychedelic posters and pipes and all that stuff. So I, I fit right in mm. over there. First head shop was on 9th Street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like off 2nd, maybe? Uh, yeah. Was right around, well, it was right around the corner from where Veselka is now. Yeah. Right. I think Veselka might have actually been there. Yeah, I think it's been there for yeah. a long time. I, I remember going into the first head We have, we overlapped before we met later on. And we both were at Woodstock at the festival. Yes. We're old people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the precursor to you meeting, do you want to just, what's the musical backdrop at this point? At that then? Yeah, at that time, yeah. Like that? What, what was the music that you were like inhaling and, and digesting as a, as a young person? Oh, everything. Mm. Yeah. Listen yeah. to everything. I think, it, it, you know, radio was very uh, homogenous. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, you know, they played they played everything really. Yeah, the there were everything wasn't as um genre specific as it is now. So on the same radio station you'd hear James Brown and then you'd hear the Rolling Stones and you know something that now it's gone all that the days of Yeah. everything being played together certainly. <laughs> but that's that started going out a long time ago. And, you know, we liked the Velvet Underground. We were all aware of those guys. They showed up in the midst of the Flower Power era with this, you know, dark record about heroin and death. And that, that <laughs> and it got everybody's attention, certainly. And so tell us, how did you guys first meet? I had a... F I, you know, everybody, it was kind of incestuous. Everybody was somehow related to everybody else on the scene. Yeah. And I just went to their first show with the Stilettos. She was doing this girl trio thing. And I actually, I wound up going to the first event of theirs and was very taken with Debbie. I thought she was terrific. And that was it. And then I, I became the first non uh, I became a regular member of the band <laughs> after that. Of a band called the Stilettos. The right? Stilettos, yeah. Yeah. Sort of girl, campy, cabaret, R&B thing. And when you referred to the scene, you said, oh, everyone knew each other on the scene. What was the scene? Just, you know, the art scene and the spillover from Max's Kansas City. CBS hadn't really started up. It was, it was going when we first met, but it hadn't really started the ongoing band situation that came later. 
But so, it, you know, the art scene was heavily mixed in with the music scene. The music scene was still coming out of the West Village with the remnants of the 60s bands, um, you know, like the, the Night Owl and the Love and Spoonful and all that stuff and the folk music scene. Uh, it, it, yeah, everybody was kind of, it was a lot of maybe more of a small town thing. And there seems to be sort of a, a, a video and film thing happening at the same time in downtown. There's almost like a mini Hollywood effect going on but in, within your your community with people like Amos Poe and Jim Jarmusch. And, and I mean, do you want to talk about that whole scene and how music and film was connected? Well, I, to me, the central milieu was always Max's, where, which was the... Everything sort of radiated out from there because that's where all the art people in the arts met and collected. Mm-hmm. And that was the Max's uh, from yeah. before the 70s. It yeah. later evolved into a, a a pretty much a, a, club, a yeah. rock place. But, but when Mickey Ruskin originally owned it, I mean, he's the guy who invented the velvet rope situation, you know, whereby, really? you know. Yeah, and he was the, he was the first one to have people waiting outside and go. You you can come in. You can't come in. You know. <laughs> yeah. So that was, wow. Yeah. And is now the right time to show a little clip from this um, one of the films that you were in, Debbie? Or do you want me to not do that? This uh, the unmade beds. You know, oh. one of those movies. Just yeah. to give an idea of the time. Uh, Amos Poe, yeah. yeah. Unmade beds. Oh, was that Duncan? Duncan Hannah. Yeah. Who is a painter. Yeah, P- Duncan the painter. Curse you, YouTube. Well, we were all such brats, you know. She looked really good. You ready stuff. to take my picture? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. My name is Rico. Not little Rico. Rico the photographer. Rico the liar. Rico, the one that falls in love with his eyes, but never with his heart. Rico. That's me. Yes, it's true. But little Rico is someone I could kiss. What do you want these pictures, anyhow? The Duncan's pretty gorgeous, too. Can I have some vodka? Sure. Pour me one, too. Pictures are for publicity, to put in the windows and bars, and for newspapers, and one for my boyfriend. Now, Amos thought that he was Godard. <laughs> so, and we got we got to meet Godard around this period a few years later. Really? There was, yeah. yeah. There was yeah. there was a lot of we had this idea to remake Alphaville, so we actually we got to hook up with Godard, and he sold us the rights for a thousand bucks, which we later found out he really didn't have. <laughs> And I think Amos actually has the contract somewhere, but it wow. never got remade. And uh, he was talking about pictures in that. You, of course, were a keen photographer as well, Chris. Yeah, I was, I was at the School of Visual Arts, and I, was, I started doing shooting when I was a little kid with my little dinky cameras, and then I started more seriously at around 68. And I was just always dragging a camera around. And you brought some, some pictures in I as well. I have some old pictures here. Singing. Oh yeah, she has a little ditty she sings. So these these are the pictures that you brought in for us today. Uh, yeah, that's Debbie and Iggy on the Idiot Tour in '77. That's Debbie in front of CB's on. A yeah, did we ever find out who owned that car? No, I never found any any backstory. That car, on the car. was always parked in front of CB's, and nobody knew whose car yeah. it was. That's Devo in our hallway. Amazing. Yeah. That's a real early shot I took with a timer. Yeah, 105 Thompson Street. Yeah, on Thompson Street. Clem really doesn't like that because he has long hair, and he decries his his days as a deadhead. <laughs> That's Kim Fowley in Los Angeles of the Runaways, you know, the guy who invented the Runaways and many other things. 
That's Lester Bangs on the, in an outtake from Mutant Monster Beach Party, was, which was done for Punk Magazine. And people, and that's, that's at Coney Island. That was at Coney Island, yeah. yeah. And that's Eric Emerson and Sesu Coleman, who were these guys were in a kind of bridge band that went from the the glam New York glitter, Dolls era glitter, glitter. into the punk era. You know, Eric died early. He was a terrific character. He was he was in a bunch of the Warhol films. He was one of the superstars, sort of. He was in Heat and Lonesome Cowboys and those suckers. <laughs> that was yeah, got the t-shirt yeah. yes yeah I came right from the gym and I love to work out in my Ramon shirt excuse me you know <laughs> something and Richard uh, it was his, at his last gig with the Heartbreakers that's upstairs at Max's and Richard the, Hell yeah and that's Walter Lure's hand that's one of my favorite pictures of mine it's very noir and the screamers from L.A. and the, the guy on the, the left, Tomato, we knew from uh, the weird sort of shock rock drag scene in New York much earlier, even before the CB scene. I, he was uh, in New York. And that Steve Bader is um, just like a couple of weeks before he died in Paris. Now going back to the Ramones, and you keep you've mentioned CBs at least five times already. Yeah, that. Let, let's define. Um, you're of course referring to the legendary club venue CBGBs in New York. Um, I think it's worth having a conversation about CBGBs and and what it meant to you and what it was like. Well, I spent a lot of time there. I have a thing there tomorrow. I got a, got some interview with German TV at the, and I you know I haven't even set foot in the Barbados store like ever so I will go in there tomorrow just to define what what are you talking about when well, you say well CBGB's is now the um a clothing store a high end men's clothing store which is John Varvatos which is a really nice guy actually I just haven't gotten in there it's kind of mind boggling to walk on the block I, you know I, I, used to, I used to spend so much damn time there and now when I walk there it's kind of Disorienting because it's 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 just so different. It's even hard to see where you are physically. So it's fair to say that CBGBs was really a hub for, you know, the your scene at that particular time and your peers. And who were some of the other artists and and sort of creatives that would just be hanging out there every night? Oh, Lance, Lance Loud. You know, anybody know who Lance Loud? There was, a, there was a Lance Loud was the victim of the very first reality TV show, I dare say, mm -hmm. which was called An American Family, whereby uh, the cameras followed this family around for years at a time, and in the midst of this show, the son came came out as gay. And this was a real big deal. I don't. I don't know. I should have a time. I don't have a time frame. I haven't really thought about this. But um, and that was Lance, and he had a. He wound up in CBGBs with a band called the uh, Mumps, right? Yeah, I think so. And uh, and it eventually uh, tore up the family, broke up the marriage. Um, <laughs> perfect ending, cataclysmic ending. I think they. I think they did an HBO docu about the show. But I'm not sure. Mm. It's kind of obscure stuff. Mm. And everyone refers to CBGBs as famously being like stinky, nasty, smelly, dark. It was pretty dark nasty and, and stinky, and there were dogs who used to poop around and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I I wonder. You know, uh, I've heard that uh, there's a lot of sort of areas, uh, or potentially, you know, so the sort of creativity of the time in Berlin now. Does anybody know about that? Is that, is that reality? Yeah, it's all happening over there. It's pretty yeah. cool. And it, I mean, it must have been amazing to feel that momentum. Were you aware of how significant the momentum that was going on in and around the orbit of that club was at the time, or was it just a club that you used to hang out in? I think Did everybody was pretty much in the moment. I don't. Yeah. Really, I don't think I, I certainly I wasn't. I don't think I was thinking. Yes, yeah, so I think it was a love-hate relationship, and you know, as they say, the best bar or club is the one closest to home. So you know, for many of us, 
that was the truth. That was the, the reality that, you know, we lived within, you know, uh, I don't know, five or six block radius of, of the club. So it, it, it started out really as a local phenomenon, and, and, and it, it just grew because we, we built it, you know, uh, through the press. You know, there was, uh, I don't know, it was very kind of intimate and personal, and, and the newspapers started covering it. And then, um, you know, fledgling managers would, you know, come in and they would, uh, you know, sort of try to promote people and um, it just sort of built up. It was a, a sort of a natural build, which which worked to our benefit, worked to all of our benefits because we were allowed to uh, develop our our sounds, our act, our artistry, our thinking in veritable, you know, privacy, you know, and, you know, we would face the criticism of our, our you know, contemporaries, which was often, you know, very uh, extreme. Um, but you know, important. So, you know, that that was kind I of a, a real plus. What I've often said is, you know, the the scene there and in Seattle and in Liverpool and a few other places really got to ferment for a while before mm. it was jumped on by the media. Nowadays, as soon as something rears its head even that much, it's you know, it's out there for everybody to see. So I don't know if that situation can ever really happen again. Just, yeah, this was before. Cell phones, even. Oh. Yeah, let alone all the rest of this stuff. Yeah. But, and, and certainly the love-hate thing is, a, I mean, everybody then had a real love-hate relationship with the city in general. I remember everybody was always going, oh, I can't wait to get out of here. It's so crummy. It's so dirty. And that was, that was a constant theme. And now I wish it was that crummy and dirty again, you know, <laughs> certainly. Was everyone broke back then? Yeah, and yeah, and it was also very. That's the other. Yeah, I mean, the main thing was it was so easy to live here for cheap, for yeah. no money. It didn't cost anything to live here. When I was in the '60s, there were still apartments. I had new people who had apartments that cost twenty dollars a month for a tub and kitchen. You know, on the Lower East Side, you know, single room, you could get you get twenty bucks a month. It's it's uh, you know, it's like might as well be eighteen eighty eight. You know, and uh, and. Fa- <laughs> Uh, famously, when you started Blondie, you had this this top to bottom house almost, right? Where you had, had a creative yeah. space that you could just rehearse in. We had three floors over a liquor store that we moved in. This crazy friend of ours was the proprietor of. I don't know. He got he got it from Ansel, another long incestuous story. So he wound up with this three story loft, which he invited us to move into, which was really nice and cheap. Yeah, well, yeah, it was like yeah. was it three hundred bucks a month or something? No, it was a hundred and a quarter. That, well, I was I don't know if that was our share. Or yeah, that was our share. Yeah. yeah. And where was that? Uh, Two sixty six Bowery. It's there's there's no landmarking on it. <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of area was that it back was, then? It was, well, the guy from the Marbles lives there. Yeah, now. well, somebody. Yeah, we were in there like a few years ago. They they yeah, they right. sectioned it all off and. Ruined it's, it. It's still kind of wrecked. The, for the top floor, no, the top floor is, the top floor is still yeah, wrecked. Yeah, it's still destroyed. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. It's, we wound up in there doing some TV thing. It's yeah. I mean, it's, it's like some Chinese absentee landlord who doesn't give a fuck and is not. Oh, you know. I thought that woman owned it. No, I, nah, somebody else owns it. Some mm. guy. But it's now it's right across the street from the museum of something or other. What is that <laughs> down there on the Bowery? New museum, New yeah. museum okay, yeah. That, so that you know, it's it's not what I mean. It used to be across the street. There were just derelict, empty storefronts that all the homeless guys would live in. Only in those days, you didn't call them homeless; they were just bums. So, yeah, they were bums. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you were cold, probably no, not much central heating, and you were in this kind of empty, <laughs> empty space. But what did this space give birth to, creative? Well, we, creatively speaking. We rehearsed there and did a lot of stuff for the first album. The build-up to the first album went on there. And then, and then we would just go across the street to CBGB's. It was a, you know it was like one block below Houston Street. And yeah. we would just drag this stuff to CBGB's. And we, at one point, we played at CBGB's every weekend for seven months in a row. Wow. So I remember that noting that at the time. So, as Blondie was your was your first gig officially at CB's? No, the first gig mm. was at this. The first gig with Gary was at oh shit, some bar. The Mushroom. No, I can't no. remember what the hell it was called. 
Now, I have it. It's in the book. It's in Making Tracks. The, uh. the, there's actually a photo from it. It was another bar. Because mm -hmm. there were a bunch of uh, other places that people played at alternately. And when you finally did perform at your sort of home club, CBGBs, you know, and you've got people like the Ramones or Talking Heads in the audience or whatever, you know, what did they say after you performed? And, and was that a bit nerve-wracking for you, performing in front of your friends? Yeah. No, the, the band people weren't that critical. Yeah. It was um, just nerve-wracking It was performing. the other assholes that hung around, you know. They always had something to say. But, the, you know, like the band guys were you know, all paranoid about what they were doing. So, I mean, everybody was sort of, oh, like, you know, sort of staggering around and trying to figure it out. And, you know, everybody said, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, nice show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's kind of amazing when you think about just, you know, going on this in this dark, crappy bar for 20 people and being uptight and worrying about how, how you're going to come off, you yeah. know. So yeah. somehow it went from being basically as hip and cool as you could possibly be to now where we can say that you've sold 40 million records. I think the official statistic is Something. this day. That's this a day. drop in the bucket. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody remember what, <laughs> we remember what records were. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what to call it anymore. Yeah. It's not, you know, we call it a collection. At this collection, point. Yeah. yeah. But what was the tipping point? What was that moment where you went from playing for your, for your mates, basically, in, in, a, in a bar to suddenly... <laughs> being asked to go abroad or being on tour or having a hit record? It, was, it took a couple of years to build up. We went to L.A. Um, that was a big deal, going to L.A. for the first time. Yeah. The first gigs we did out of town were like Boston and Philadelphia. Uh, going on tour with Iggy was a big deal. That was, that was pretty awesome. You know, we, the Idiot Tour included... Bowie backing up Iggy on keyboards and singing backups, and that was an amazing moment. So we were suddenly out in America in 1977 with that, and that was terrific. And then you, you had a hit in Australia, right? The hit in Australia probably predated the Iggy thing, okay. maybe. I don't know. when like It could have even been... I don't know the dates of this shit. Maybe 76 was the hit, and then the other stuff, then it's even really started kicking off in 77. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not good at Somebody that. has to look it up and put it as a crawl, you know. I don't know how, I mean, it's important that, you know, it was this, this sort of gradual buildup, and, and I think that that's what we're trying to talk about, is that, you know, there was this, as Chris says, fermentation for us, you know, and, and not instant exposure and... and you know, this, this kind of worldwide manufactured exposure. It's a true New York moment right now. Um, please join me in welcoming the amazing Chris Stein and Debbie Harry. How are you both feeling? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having us. It's our pleasure. I guess you should turn this that off. Yeah, okay. place is so opulent. <laughs> I can't believe this is all was paid for by the proceeds of caffeinated sugar beverages. Pretty much. Amazing. Yeah. What was um? What did West 18th Street look, used to look like? Uh, before this was 18th Street. Well, where we are right means now. here. Oh. Physically, it wasn't that different. It was pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. but mm. it's just the interiors have changed. Yeah. And the quality of the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chris is very impressed with the... So you have red cameras, I cameras. see. Cameras. Yeah, those are not cheap. Well, you were sort of a pioneer of early, early New York camera stuff, weren't you? I mean, you did, you did one of the first almost like pirate TV. We did this thing called TV Party, which was on cable TV once a week. Amazing. And, and I guess it started in, I don't know, 1980, 79, 80. It went on for four years. At that point, cable TV was only available from 14th Street, no, 23rd Street uptown. So if you lived below 23rd Street, you couldn't see it anyway. It was only for the well-to-do. And, and what did you do on TV party? They smoked a lot of weed and went crazy and... and had, you know, just carried on. It was kind of like going to a club 
once a week, but everybody just gathered in this TV studio. Well, we'd start out in the in the bar across the street, yeah, and then work our way across into the studio. So that was always nice. And what, what kind of characters did you get to meet on TV party? Well, everybody was on the show at one point. Uh, Iggy was on, and uh, The Clash. I think, I think Mick Jones was on. And yeah, there we have TV party outtakes. It's very entertaining. That's Glenn O'Brien. He is the host of TV Party. He's trying to revamp it now. It's, it's out there. But he's Wasn't, an, uh, he's an old Niall guy. Niall on one time? Niall was on. Niall was on. George Clinton was on. George Clinton, one of his very few TV appearances, was on TV Party. You have the, a Basquiat interview on there Basquiat as well. Basquiat was on frequently. He, he did the camera. And those things that Glenn is holding up, those scribbles are by Jean-Michel probably. And yeah, those are Jean-Michel. Are in Glenn's archives of worth millions of dollars. It's amazing, yeah. So Jean-Michel Basquiat did the did the titles for your Yeah, and he for, typed in that TV stuff. Party, yeah, so. he was frequently typing in that that this was all very high tech at the time. Typing? That doesn't look like typing. All the stuff, the, the scribble, those are scribble. No, no, the overlay, the extra bread, oh, blah blah blah. Oh, that that in all, in all probability is John <laughs> typing that stuff. That was Richie Fliegler. He was, he was in a lot of bands.